All right, it's time for us to go ahead and get started tonight. A uh, couple of announcements before we get into our Bible study itself. Travis Richardson is back in the hospital at Princeton. He's in ICU. He took a fall, and he also had surgery to remove a blood clot. So continue to remember him in your prayers. And also continue to remember Eddie's mother. She's improving, and uh, she continues to ask for our prayers as she does that. And so keep her in your prayers. Also, I hope that you're getting the uh, week, midweek updates. Those should be texted out just like the bulletin and everything else. So uh, you have those announcements during the, during the Wednesday that you receive those. Are there any other announcements we need to add to our list tonight? If not, our opening prayer will be led by Brother Ed Griffith, and then I will be leading us in one verse of number 414. And uh, we'll go ahead and ask Brother Ed to lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful unto thee for this blessing that's been ours to enjoy a beautiful day that you've sent our way. We pray that the things we've done and the sick said today that's been a pleasing to thee and always upbuilding to your name. Help us to always be mindful as we walk through life and make this journey that we're responsible to speak and talk to those along the way. Thank you for your great love for us, for your son and the tormenting death that he went through to share that love with us through the forgiveness of our sins and help us each day to thank you and work in a way that we try to prove ourselves to hopefully some be someday be worthy of that blessing to have a home with you in heaven. We're thankful for this Bible study that we can have and learn from your word and learn to love each other and to enjoy this fellowship. We pray for those two that have been mentioned that are troubled in this world, Miss Bull. Pray that you be with her and those that ministering to them. Pray that you be with Travis and the difficulty that, that he's going through right now, that you be with his family, be with him, and especially be with those doctors that are trying to alleviate and fix his troubled body. Be with each one of us as we uh, sit in this class that we put aside the things around us, the things we've done today, and try to put aside the world so that we can concentrate upon your word. We're thankful for the Brother Mark and his amazing ability to decipher your word down to its simplest form that each one of us can fully understand and know what we must do to prepare ourselves to have that home. For this we give thanks in Christ our Savior's name. Amen. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go, anywhere he leads me in this world below, anywhere Thirty-four, softly and tenderly as our song of invitation. Like many of you in my lifetime, I have seen a number of changes that have taken place, and I don't think there's anything any greater that has changed in my lifetime than this. When I was just a young boy, very young in days, men and women still opposed those things that were evil. And then as I grew a little bit older, people began to change, and almost inexplicably, they began to 
accept evil to some degree. So they came to the idea, well, you do your thing and I'll do mine and we'll all just get along. And now things have changed once again. Many are calling that which is good evil and they're calling that which is evil good. And so we've seen a complete reversal almost of those kinds of things. But I want to suggest to you tonight four things that you can do with evil. Matter of fact, four things that you should do with evil. Number one, you should hate evil. In the book of Romans chapter 12 at verse 9, the Bible says, Let love be genuine, abhor. That word abhor simply means to utterly detest or be repulsed by. Abhor that which is evil and hold fast to that which is good. Number two, turn away from evil. In 1 Peter chapter 3 at verse 11, the Bible says, Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. And so we are to hate it. We are to turn away from it. Number three, we are to abstain from it. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 at verse 22, the Bible simply says, Abstain from every form of evil. But then number four, we should overcome evil with good. And that's found in the book of Romans chapter 12, verse 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. As we close this little devotional part out, I would remind you of what he said in the book of John, chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. There the Bible says, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done what we've been talking about tonight, evil, those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. You know, I don't want to be found in that last group. And the only way that I can be found in the first group, those who have done good and have the resurrection of life, is to have the blood of Jesus Christ cleansing my sins and the only way that I can meet that is in baptism, being buried with my Lord in baptism. Tonight it may be you need to do that. It may be that you need to come back to the Lord, make a confession of sins that you have in your life. We'd love to pray with you and for you. If you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, why don't you do it right now as we stand and as we stand. Wednesday night, but I know that you're going to enjoy the lessons that he has prepared for us. And so we'll go ahead and turn it over to Brother Mike. It's good to be back. Felt like I was missing something for a year now. But we're back. So <clears throat> what I'm going to do is start a series of lessons that probably last for a good little while. And unlike most of the classes that you've heard me teach, I won't be using a lot of Scripture tonight. Maybe not the next time either, because what I'm going to have, what I'm trying to do, and what I need to do is, I need to get our minds prepared 
for what we're going to talk about with Scripture a little later. Now, let me say right now that you're not going to hear a lot about COVID, okay? We've heard enough about that. Plenty. But, I'm going, to use, I'm going to use this as a stepping stone to get to where we are or where, we, where I want us to go. So, we're all familiar with COVID-19. And I think we would all agree that it's an extraordinary event in our lifetime. I don't remember another one in my lifetime that was as extraordinary as this, that had as much effect on my life as this has for the past year now. And it's on everybody's mind. It's in the news. It's in entertainment. And what we found with this is is that there is an extraordinary, extraordinary amount of human suffering that's come along with it. All kinds. Most every family in here has been affected by it. I had to take a mask off now to so I could speak plain. We've done a, we've had we've been away from church services. We've been away from our social life, and we've had folks that have actually gotten sick from this thing, and families, and if we half our family had, and we know some that has. So it has been an extraordinary thing. And I know, I've heard, and I'm sure you've heard too, people ask the question, why are we suffering today from COVID-19? I've heard it. You've heard it. And we also have a number of other afflictions that we're suffering from right now. So COVID-19 is on our mind. Because we're all suffering from it. The whole world is suffering from it. And I think we'll all agree that this pandemic that we find ourselves in now with the associated suffering that goes along with it is an extraordinary event. I don't think anybody would argue with that point. But Is it an unprecedented event? Yes, it is in our lives, no question. But our lifetime is not but a very small part of the history of mankind. Even though The psychologists tell us that we have a tendency to focus on the present and the things that are affecting us in the present. And we tend to mushroom those things out with respect to what's going on before us. And when we look at it, when we look at our suffering in that light that my suffering today is an unprecedented event. We're wrong. And it makes our suffering worse because what it does, for one thing, it makes us start asking questions. So, yes, this thing we're going through now is unprecedented. But there have been extraordinary events throughout the history of the world. We're not the only one. We're not the only generation of mankind that is suffering the problems of life and then this extraordinary problem that's come along with us here in the last year or so. So, suffering is undeniable today. We all suffer to some degree because of this thing that's going around. 
And here's what happens. We ask the question, why? Why is it that the world is suffering this pandemic today? Why is it that I am suffering the problems in my life that I'm suffering? Because these things is the kindling for us to begin to think. Why? And there's nothing wrong with that. It's good. Somebody has a death in the family and this asks, why? Somebody becomes sick and the question is, why? Somebody gets hurt or killed in a car wreck and the question is, why? Why did it happen? Now here's the danger. If we don't understand our suffering, here's the danger in it. And this is why it's so important for us to discuss this thing is why do people suffer? We start asking ourselves, why am I suffering? And we ask the question, what's causing my suffering? And we go even a little bit further and we expand this thing out and we say, why does so much of suffering exist? Most of us in here have probably done that. No, we have. And we deserve answers. Those people that are suffering need and deserve an answer as to why. So, again, here's the real reason why we're going to spend some time studying it. Because here's what's happened with our thought processes. Those thought processes of asking why usually start moving toward a situation that's false. And we get to these conclusions. If God is all-powerful, why don't he do something to prevent or end my suffering? I don't believe there's anybody in here really hadn't heard somebody say that or even thought it themselves about their own. The other leg of that drifting up down is if God's all loving, why don't he do something to prevent or end my suffering? And then the third leg of that is, if God created me and this world that he has put me in, see, it's all God's fault. Why did he create so much suffering? And they are good questions. They are questions that we deserve an answer to. And then we move on in our thinking sometimes on our own, sometimes prompted by others in the world, we move on to this conclusion that God is either not all of him or he is not all powerful or he's not the creator. And that's where this questions as to why I suffer can be so dangerous if we are unaware and uninformed because it can lead us to apostasy. And again, we got a bunch of folks in the world that help us, help steer us in that direction too. So, the devastating effects of this is, why would I believe in a God serve a God, respect a God who allows his creatures to suffer so much. Now, if I began asking myself this one, and it's human nature to do it, and I'm sure we all do it to some degree, this is where it leads to damnation, really. So, 
What we're going to do in the next classes, I won't say a few because I don't think it'll be a few. Dr. Dave Miller wrote a little book. I'll show you the book. It's called Why People Suffer. And if you're interested in this, you can find it here at this web address. You can order it there or if he would get a few lessons that he's taken out of that. But he does a masterful job in answering these questions. So, this is what we're going to follow coming in the next few lessons. Now, up front, Dr. Miller makes this statement. He said, human beings have suffered an unfathomable amount of suffering throughout the history of the world. Now, why does that help me? Because if I am familiar with the fact that people throughout history have suffered as much as I have and that it's common to all men, then I don't have to think that it's just me. That it's just me that God is allowing to suffer. So, what Dr. Miller does in the first part of his book, he lists the three main sources of calamity. That's his words. The three, of course, we're all aware of is natural disasters, man's inhumanity to men, man, and diseases. So in order to reinforce what Dr. Miller is saying here about I'm not the only one. Let's, let's go back five centuries. Just five centuries. No further back. But just the last 500 years. And see what's happened to this world. See, he's going to talk about he's talking about earthquakes, the tsunamis that come from those things. He's talking about volcanoes, hurricanes, tornadoes, flooding, all these things that affect us today. So let's look at what's happened in the past. 1556, 830,000 people died from an earthquake in China. One small geographic area. Not the whole world, but one geographic area. 1850, 92,000 killed in a volcanic explosion at Mount Tambora in Indonesia. One small area. Multiple times, the Hangho River flood in China, million plus people died. Has these unprecedented things or extraordinary things happened throughout the world, throughout time? 1887, Hunan, China. Now, I may pronounce some of these geographical areas wrong, so forgive me if I do. Hunan, China, 2 million plus people died in drowning and starvation and the academic the epidemics that came as a result of the flooding and all of that mess. Two million plus. 1931. Four million people died from flooding in China. 1970. 500,000 people died in cyclone in East Pakistan, which is now Bangladesh. Just one cyclone now. Half a million dead. 1976, 779,000 people died from an earthquake in China. 1989, 1,300 killed in Bangladesh from a tornado. 
1999, 15,000 plus died in a rains and mud flies in Venezuela. 2003, 70,000 died from a heat wave in Europe. Two thousand four. Two hundred and thirty thousand was killed in the Indian Ocean tsunami. You know, I'm I'm ashamed to admit. But most of these things in this last bunch has been during my lifetime. And you know the only one that I remember is this one. That's how much I've paid attention to what's happening to folks around the world. And natural disasters. Kills one million people around the world every 10 years. So the fact is, natural disasters has been common to man throughout his history, not just in our lifetime. As bad as we think some of these natural disasters are. We see them, the tsunamis, the hurricanes, the tornadoes, and they're bad. Nobody downplays those. But those things have happened to mankind throughout the history of the world. And we just looked at the last five centuries. I'm not the only one. My generation is not the only one that has to face or has had to face these things. Second one that he lists is man's own inhumanity to man. Two sixty four BC to to four thirty five AD, three and a half million died from the gladiatorial combat during the Roman Empire. And we've all seen these things dramatized in movies and television and all that. Three and a half million were killed that way. B.C. 68 through 73, a million two hundred thousand Jews was killed in the siege of Jerusalem by the Romans. 1366, half a million Hindus were massacred. 1924 through 53, 30 million deaths in Stalin's regime in Russia that he killed his own people. 1949 through 1975, 40 million deaths in Mao Zedong's regime in China. 40 million of his own people he killed. 1975 to 1978, a million six hundred thousand killed by the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. Now, I remember this one. American Civil War, half a million people killed. World War One, sixteen million man killing man. World War Two, fifty six million. All these numbers are foot noted in his book. So there's research that went with this. Korean War, three million estimated deaths. Curtin, 45% of rapes reported to the police in South Africa are child rapes. Imagine what that's saying. 50% of South Africa's children abused before 18. Again, imagine what that's saying and the inhumanity that man has put on man. Got your barf bag ready? Fifty million unborn children have been extinguished in America. Fifty million. 400 million in China have been extinguished. Man has been inhuman to man for the history of the world, not just today. 
All of these don't mention the other things that we see, which people being betrayed, divorce, depression, alcoholism, drug addiction that's brought on by somebody else's influence. Physical disaster <clears throat> that's brought on by someone else's influence. Not to even mention crime. Human error. Freak accidents, automobile accidents, plane crashes, lost of ships at sea. These are where somebody else was responsible, even though it was an accident, they were responsible for the death of so many people. Again, the fact is, man's humanity, inhumanity to man has been common throughout history. Diseases and pandemic, pandemics. Diseases. Antonin Plague in that 100 of 165 A.D., half a million died. One year, half a million, or five million people died. Plague in Justinian in 541, 542, 25 million died. Black Death in 1346, 1353, 200 million people died. The third cholera uh, pandemic in 1852 to 1860, a million died from it. The flu pandemic of 1889 to 1890, a million died. The sixth cholera pandemic, 1910, 1911, 800,000 died. The global flu pandemic in 1918, you know, this one's been mentioned a little bit on the news. 50 million people in 1918. Asian flu in 1956, 58, 2 million. Through February of this year, the COVID-19 has claimed two and a half million people. Now, what's this telling us? That these events in our lives, specifically the COVID thing now, it's extraordinary, no question. But it is not unprecedented. And that's something that we, as we go through our lives and we suffer, we need to understand that it's just not me, it's just not my generation. Mankind has suffered terribly throughout his history. Before I get into this, Does it not, or is it not necessary that we, as we go through this life and we see suffering and we feel suffering, that we understand that it's just common to mankind? It's not just aimed at me. I live in this world. The world has suffered now for centuries, and it's just common. I'm as common as the last folks that's lived in the last 500 years. We need to have that in our arsenal to defend ourselves. So, this suffering is here. It's been around. And you know what makes this thing, this suffering so much worse? We got people in this world today that throw salt in our wounds. People who are suffering 
there are other people that are making it worse, that are just chunking salt into these wounds, and it hurts worse. Now, what am I talking about? Well, let me give you a clue. If you're suffering, and you think there's no reason for it, it makes it worse if you understand why you're suffering. If I'm going through something bad, if I understand why I'm going through this suffering, then it makes it easier. Let me give you an example. A woman in childbirth suffers, no question. But she knows why she's suffering. She knows that there is a benefit for her. She knows that there's blessings when it's over with. Now think about these situations where a mother has to go through the pains of birth knowing that that child is going to be dead when it's delivered. How much more, how much worse is her suffering than it would be if she knew that she was going to have a bright baby full of life, full of pleasures. You see, suffering is not just physical. But along with the physical goes the mental part goes with it. And that's what makes these folks so terrible. Who am I talking about? I'm talking about the atheists and the the evolutionists. What do they tell us? They tell us that we live in a monumental cosmic accident. Everything happens in this world is an accident. There's no rhyme, no reason, no purpose for it. My suffering... There is no reason. Everything is just an accident in this world. Now these are quotes from some of the writers. All my suffering is accidental without cause and without benefit. I just suffer. I suffer the physical pain of it and I suffer the mental and psychological pain because I don't know why I'm suffering. And because we have folks out there that's telling us you're suffering and there ain't no reason for it and there's no benefit. They tell us that the physical realm has no purpose. This life we're in has no purpose. Suffering surface serves no ultimate purpose. There's no ultimate purpose for me suffering. It is a chance phenomena in an unsensical universe. Now, that's big words, but what you're really saying is all my suffering is by chance and by accident. I'm going to suffer for no reason and for no benefit. If an infant being existed, he would exercise his perfect compassion and his omnipotence to prevent human suffering. And that's their martyr. Well, how about the astrologers and the psychics? They tell us our suffering is just simply fate. It's written in the stars. The universe has been pre-programmed. It's what's going to happen is going to happen. There's nothing I can do about my suffering. There's no reason why I suffer. And there's no benefit. I just suffer. That's what they're saying. The Hindu tells us suffering is a result of passing repeatedly through multiple lives in an effort to get it right. Reincarnation. We live. We die. We reincarnate into another life. We live and we die. And they throw out the word karma. But you know, Along with that, they say that 
They don't remember anything in that past life. Well, how are you going to get it right in this life if you can't remember anything that went wrong or right in the past life? Buddhists tell us that suffering is only our unfulfilled desires. Our suffering is because we desire something and we don't get it. In other words, to stop suffering extinguishes desires by changing your consciousness. Change what you want. Change your desires. Change your life. Then you stop suffering. Problem is, when we change what we want, when we change our life, we still suffer. But we, know, we can know why. Buddhists say, detach yourself from things and person. Well, yeah. That probably would reduce our suffering if we detached ourselves from the things we want and from the people we know, family, friends, acquaintances, but we still have suffering. The Islamist tells us that suffering is the will of Allah. This is good. They say Allah responds with harsh, cruel treatment on his creatures for the failure to submit to him. Their God torments them because they cannot live up to his law, even though he's trying. So when we look at all of these salt slingers, They tell us there's, that it's meaningless, our suffering. That it's just fate. It's unfulfilled desires. It's just simply karma. In other words, there's no cause, no benefit for why I'm suffering. And here I am. I am in reality suffering from the natural desires. Natural disasters from somebody's inhumane treatment to me from sicknesses and pandemics I'm suffering them but these people are telling me that there is no reason for it that there's no benefit in it and then I suffer mentally and psychologically So, all these folks listed here, all the suffering, all the bad stuff that happens for me is for no reason. And if I got to suffer for no reason at all, that hurts. That hurts multiplied. we got the suffering in the world which nobody can deny we got people telling us that our suffering is for no reason no benefit but we know that suffering happens there's no question about it it's not like why am I suffering or what causes it or what's the benefit out, of, out, benefit out of it? We just flat out know when we're hurting, don't we? So it happens. Suffering is happening. And then the salt slingers tell us that there's no benefits from it. Now, I know that I suffer. And because I am suffering... It makes me more open to believe what these folks are saying, that there's no benefit from it. And I can't do anything about it. So the question is, 
Do the salt slingers have it right? Is knowing that I'm suffering, is there really a reason for it? Is there a why for it? Is there a benefit for my suffering? So do they have it right? Or is there a reason for all this bad stuff? Now that's where we're going to go in these lessons coming up. Why am I suffering? And we can know that. Why does bad stuff happen to people? See, when it really gets down to it, I can't deny that I'm suffering. But I could tolerate it better if I knew there was a benefit to me because of my suffering. I told you there wouldn't be much scripture in this right now because we're getting... Trying to get our minds ready for it. Now, are these, quote, salt slingers, or are they the only source that tries to tell us why we're suffering? Or that there's no benefit for it? Or is there another source? There is the Bible approach. And through it, we can make sense of our suffering. We can understand why we go through suffering. We can understand why the world, back for the last 500 years, has gone through suffering. Larry, call me out if I run over. Now, If you're going through a terrible time in your life, could you not tolerate it better if you knew why? And if you knew that there was a benefit to you because you're going through that suffering? So we'll we'll just put our toes in the water on this tonight. When When we look at the Bible approach, one that satisfies, there are some major premises that's given to us in the Scripture concerning life. One of them is, and we won't, we won't go into any kind of effort to try to prove this or make a defense for it because I think we all in this audience understand these things here to be true. But we've got to keep these on our mind to understand why I suffer. I can know that God of the Bible exists and controls my world. I know there is a God, and I know that He controls the world because His Word tells us. The second premise is this. I can know that the Bible is God's inherent, inspired word, and because it is, I can know that it contains sufficient explanations to make sense of my suffering. Now, these are the premises we're going to go on. We're not going to try to prove them or defend them, but we're going to, we're going to take these things and run with them. We also know this. Is why I know that the Bible teaches that my life on earth is temporary, ending in death. Now, we don't have to tell the Bible tell us that, do we? We see that all, we see that around us every day, people dying. But to understand why we suffer, we have to keep it in our minds that life on earth is temporary and it ends at death. That's a given. I live on this earth a few short years and that's it. It's temporary. 
And we don't have to have the Bible to tell us that. We know that. But it does teach that. And at death I go to the grave. Let's see if I can get through this in the next few minutes. Don't want to separate this out. When I die, after death, my body goes into the grave, my conscious spirit enters the Hadean world realm to await the final judgment. At some time after that, God calls a halt to human existence on the earth, destroys this world and everything in it, After that, or during that point of time, really, Christ comes back to this world a second time. My spirit comes forth from Hades to be joined with my resurrected body into an immortal body. And then I face God in judgment and consign to heaven or hell for eternity. Now, why did I go through that? Because I get only one shot at preparing myself for eternity. See, because when I die, it's all out of my hands. It's all in God's hands. If I haven't prepared myself before I die, then I can't do anything else about it. So let me say this, and then we'll quit. My life here on this earth is just a proving ground for my future life in heaven or hell. Keep that in mind. We have to understand that principle if we're going to understand why we suffer. Let's have a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time and for your word that teaches us the facts of life. Pray that we might always be aware of them. Be with us as we go through the week and we ask these blessings in Christ's name. Amen.